Patrick, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. This is a pleasure and I'm really looking forward to this. And this conversation comes at a really interesting time because with all this COVID-19 stuff going on and everything that surrounds that, that maybe we just all need to get back to the basics, which is really the breath. So it's a wonderful time to have this conversation. Welcome. Yeah, thanks very much, Ben. It is, surprisingly. Um, I suppose breathing when I started back in 2002, it wasn't something on the radar and there wasn't a whole lot of awareness of it. And we were applying it mainly for health. We were applying it for asthma, for snoring, for sleep apnea, and later for anxiety, for panic disorder. But in the last few years, it's been more in terms of performance-based. And I've really noticed an upswing with COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because people now have some time on their hands if they're doing less hours or not working and they can invest in themselves. So society is changing and sometimes we need to take a step back to realize what's what's important. Mm -hmm. When you say when I started breathing in 2002, I, that that uh, on the surface sounds like a strange thing to say. But but as you tell your story, I think people will understand that what you're talking about is how to breathe properly. It might be interesting to just go back and share a bit of your background and how you got into this and who you are and all of that good stuff. And then we can get into the, the specifics of the breathing side. Yeah, sure. Um, I was a kid growing up with asthma, which is a very common condition. And if you have an issue with your lungs, it's not just isolated to your lungs, even though most healthcare professionals don't see the connection because normally when Western medicine looks at the human body, they break it up into tiny pieces and they don't realize the bi-directional relationship that's going together but fun from function to function. So with asthma growing up, I had problems with my lungs, problems wheezing, wheezing continuously, taking lots of medication, few hospitalizations, but also had a constantly stuffy nose. And if you have a constant, constantly stuffy nose, um, you're more likely to be a mouth breather and you are 1.8 times more likely to have a sleep problem. So I had asthma stuffy nose and because of constant mouth breathing I have craniofacial changes to my face a high upper palate narrow jaws jaws are set back so I was predisposed then to obstructive sleep apnea so I was the kid going to sleep in school at 14 15 16 years of age totally no interest in school absolutely none and at the time you know sometimes teachers might say well this kid is just this kid is a little bit troublesome or you know not doing what they should be doing, but we never seem to consider the impact that mouth breathing is having on kids. It is having a huge impact on them. So in any event, I really worked hard. I got my degree. I went to a university in Dublin called Trinity College in Dublin. I did economics and social sciences. I came out, I was in the corporate world, absolutely hated it. I hated, I thought the company owned me. That's one thing. I hated the stress put on me and I was putting the stress on the people underneath me and there was a constant competitive vibe that one person was pitted against the other. We were being controlled by information technology, everything was controlled. We were told we had freedom but you know when I look back it was deception and I suppose it's that way in many companies. So sometimes you have to suffer and uh, yeah you do what you do, listen that's the way it is. You know, you get in there, you grin, you bear it, you do it. I didn't like it, but then I came across breathing. And I came across it, I, re I read it in an article in an mm -hmm. Irish newspaper, the importance of breathing through the nose and the importance of breathing lightly. And I was doing neither. I was a constant mouth breather. And if you were sitting beside me, you would hear my breathing mm -hmm. because I was always caught for breath. So I started putting that advice into practice. My sleep changed, my wheezing changed, and I had the calmness of the mind. I stayed in the corporate world with better sleep, with better concentration, with better ability to handle stress. Things absolutely changed in the corporate world. But then two years later, I was driving from Galway, which is on the west coast of Ireland, to Navan, which is on the east coast. It's only a two hour drive. It's not that long together. It was three hours at a time because there was no motorway. And a thought came into my mind that I need to be teaching breathing. And it was just an overwhelming feeling. Hmm. And that came in at the weekend on the Friday. And I knew the following Monday, it was time to quit my job. And that's what I did. So I trained then in breathing. Mm -hmm. That was back then, 2001, 2002. And then I started teaching it full time in 2002. 
so that's the story you know sometimes life kind of directs you in different ways and uh yeah i'm kind of you're always grateful then of those little hardships and things that you have growing up because it gives you a silver there's a silver lining generally and the other thing is it's a good experience to go through and to have that withdrawn to draw upon the fact that wheezing the fact that i was snoring the fact that i had sleep apnea the fact that i was constantly tired mm -hmm. the fact that i was stressed because then i can put the theory to the practice mm -hmm. and you know i think people as well when you're working with them i can identify with their symptoms being there and i think it's a little bit different and i think probably it builds up some trust then between myself and say students coming in and you know i can motivate them then because listen you know it does take time to focus on your breathing but ben too often we're so stuck in our heads we're constantly thinking we're asleep to thought we're regurgitating often incessant and repetitive and self-critical thoughts and we're not stepping out of the mind and one way to do that is to focus on the breath and i will say to anybody you will never waste time focusing on your breathing mm -hmm. but it's not just about focusing on the breath there is a few things you can do to your breathing that can make tremendous changes to your life and it's not about taking the big deep breath that is mm. commonly told in different in different studios there's a lot of good stuff there so you're you're still a pretty young guy but you you're a really young guy at the time and you're wheezing and short of breath and you know at some point you i guess you just had it tell yourself this is not right this is normal this is not normal this is something that there's something quite off is that is that how you felt or did you feel was there a point where you felt that you went from this wheezing and being short of breath and having a, a stuffed nose etc that that's just the way that you have a genetic predisposition for this stuff and there's nothing i can do and then you flipped it you you had a a very interesting journey there yeah i think you, you know as human beings we're pretty resilient individuals you know depending on the person you've probably got two different types of people one person is in hardship and they moan and groan and all about it and they're living in a state of anxiety and the other person you know what what can we do you know that's the situation i could accept it yeah there's times it could bring you down a little bit but you know what there's always little ups and downs in life anyway and i had accepted it that's the way it was and you learn to live with the limitations um but at the same time it's only when you have something to compare it to at the time i had nothing to compare it to because that was my life since i was a kid mm -hmm. that was my life since i was i think i was diagnosed with asthma about three four years of age the doctors didn't call it asthma at the time they call mm -hmm. it bronchitis um you know so so when you have something so long it it really depends on the frame of mind and yeah it's 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 uh it's only when when it's it's resolved or when you make a huge change to it that you can look back you can make a comparison and you know it's just like one of those things um how can you see the, how can you see the the forest for the trees you know mm -hmm. okay let's talk about nasal breathing and it sounds so easy to do when you hear oh breathe through your nose but yes. that's not how most people approach it and even you know, reading your books and I, I i've started to pay much more attention to how i'm breathing and i i do meditation so i'm nasal breathing when i'm doing that meditation but since i've got put onto you and your work i'm now starting to think about what i'm breathing all the time through through my nose but most of us we're just we're just not paying attention what is so important about nasal breathing could you break that down for us yeah in very simple terms your mouth is not made for breathing there is no function performed by the mouth in terms of breathing your mouth is for eating it's for drinking it's for speaking um your nose is for breathing if you mm. look at the structure of the human nose mm. i'm not sure i can't see a photo camera so i'm not sure what i'm looking at here but in terms of you have your breathing into the nostrils you have got turbinates here you've got a nasal cavity here and you look at the space that this is occupying in the human skull a considerable space is being occupied there when you breathe through the nose you pick up a gas called nitric oxide mm. and nitric oxide is drawn into the lungs and nitric oxide helps to redistribute the blood throughout the lungs nitric oxide also is antiviral by the way 
It's antibacterial. It's, it's a gas that plays a considerable role in the body's first line of immune defense. Now, for people with asthma, most of them will, won't breathe through their nose. Um, and I suppose you could say, like some people will say, well, I'm breathing through my nose all the time. But are you breathing through your nose during physical exercise? Are you breathing through your nose during sleep? Because here's a few things. If you're waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, having spent a few hours breathing through an open mouth, you are more likely to snore. You are more likely to stop breathing during sleep. You are more likely to have light sleep. Mm -hmm. So anybody who is wearing aura rings, they will <laughs> see generally a, a distinct and a quick improvement in the quality of their sleep just by breathing through the nose. And of course, we want the tongue resting on the roof of the mouth because we don't want the tongue f encroaching into the airway. Mm -hmm. The human airway is the width of the airway, the upper airway, which is the space at the back of the nose and the space at the back of the mouth and the throat itself is about the size of your tongue. If you have a compromised airway, mm -hmm. it's about <laughs> the size of a big biro. Mm. Now, if you're trying to breathe hard through a compromised airway with your tongue falling back into the throat and the mouth open, it's a recipe for poor sleep. So first of all, if you're waking up tired, how can you concentrate? But also, how can you have a calm mind? So that's one aspect that I'll talk about sleep and the emotions. The second aspect is physical exercise. It's easier to breathe through an open mouth during physical exercise because the air hunger generated when you breathe through your nose is too strong. But what is driving that air hunger is the resistance to breathing through your nose. Your nose is a smaller entry for the air to come into the body. So it creates a resistance. But it's by slowing down breathing and by breathing deeper through your nose, because when you breathe through your nose, you tend to bring the air deeper into the lower regions of the lungs. Nasal breathing also harnesses nasal nitric oxide and nasal nitric oxide redistributes the blood throughout the lungs. So nose breathing, both during rest and physical exercise, increases oxygen uptake in the blood by about 10%. So there's one aspect of mm -hmm. it. So the increased oxygen uptake in the blood by 10% by nasal breathing in comparison to mouth breathing. Nose breathing is more efficient because you're not wasting so much air in dead space because you are breathing slower but deeper, mm. as opposed to mouth breathing is fast and shallow. And we have to bear in mind that every breath that we take into the body, a certain amount of that air doesn't reach down into the small air sacs in the lungs. It stays in dead space. So breathing fast and shallow is very inefficient. So we need to breathe light. We need to breathe slow. We need to breathe deep. Now, when you do physical exercise with your mouth closed, carbon dioxide in the blood is higher. We know that because of the feeling of air hunger, because it is carbon dioxide that gives that stimulus to breathe. However, initially when you switch from mouth to nose breathing, it's tougher for the first six to eight weeks, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then a training adaptation takes place and then the air hunger diminishes. Now, if you look at the work by George Dallum, mm -hmm. he's a professor from, I think it's Colorado University. I'm not sure exactly which one, but he's a well-known triathlete in the United States and he switched to nasal breathing probably about six years ago. And he did a study that was published in 2018, and it's involving a small population, 10 people. He says, I want to test the impact of nasal breathing and physical exercise. There were 10 recreational athletes. He gave them the, the whole purpose of the trial was they had to breathe through their nose exclusively during physical exercise for a, a period of six months. And then he tested them. After six months of nasal breathing, when the body had adopted to breathing through the nose, and it doesn't take six months, but he used six months as the, the period mm -hmm. to force, to, you know, to get the body to make adaptations. He then tested those same individuals in a graded exercise test. What was their breathing nasally versus mouth breathing? And here's the difference. Nose breathing, there was 22% less ventilation. And these individuals could achieve 100% of the work rate intensity as compared to mouth breathing. Mm -hmm. Nose breathing, the fraction of expired oxygen was less. In other words, the body had utilized the oxygen, more oxygen that was brought into the nose was utilized by working muscles, utilized throughout the body versus mouth breathing. 
Nose breathing at 44 millimeters of mercury pressure of CO2 versus 40 with mouth breathing. Higher CO2 in the blood is important for increasing oxygen delivery to the tissues and also blood flow. So here you have a group of individuals. Can you imagine after six months of breathing through your nose during physical exercise, initially it is tougher. Your nose mm -hmm. will stream, your nose runs, the body gets used to it, and six to eight weeks is what, what it will take. Mm -hmm. There is no comparison with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Nasal mm -hmm. breathing is trauma to the upper airways. It's causing dehydration. There's a 42% greater water loss out through the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, athletes who are having to drink a lot of water you know, during different periods of physical exercise, your nose retains the moisture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so just in summary, nose breathing protects the airways, increases oxygen uptake in the blood, increases oxygen delivery. There's a better utilization of oxygen. There's a conservation of breath. There's a saving of energy because you're not having to breathe so hard for a given intensity and duration of physical exercise. And uh, yeah, overall performance yeah. improves. Before I came across your work, I thought, okay, so I get the nose, I understand the importance. I always understood the importance of nose breathing, maybe not to the extent that, that uh, you, you, you explain and certainly not uh, in terms of every day. But I always thought nose breathing during exercise, high intensity exercise, I thought that just, for me, it just goes out the window, right? I start to, you open my mouth yep. nice and nice and big, try and get as, as much as I can. Uh, and I think a lot of athletes are like that, uh, which is, so that's just one observation. But the other observation, as you describe that, is that the athletes get performance advantages from nasal breathing. But even before that, you talk in your book about like a lot of athletes just aren't even doing the basics about breathing through your nose just just generally. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit and how you, you have a, a, a thing called a bolt score. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's useful to explain. And maybe my listeners are now thinking about how they breathe. And this is a, a very interesting little test that anyone can do to, to see. Uh, well, explain that, explain that, that test and explain what, what, it, what it looks like. Yeah. The Bolt Score, um, it was first written about back in 1975 mm -hmm. by a researcher called Stanley. And it has been written about by several researchers since uh, Nishino in 2009, uh, Trembach, Messino, etc. Mm -hmm. in 2017, 2018. It's the length of your comfortable breath hold time after an exhalation. Mm. You take a normal breath in and out through your nose. Normal, you shouldn't hear it. So you're sitting down for about five minutes Take a normal breath in and out through your nose and pinch your nose with your fingers and time how long in seconds does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the, in first, in, the first involuntary movement of your breathing muscles. Mm -hmm. Then let go and breathe in through your nose and your breath at the end of the bolt score should be comfortable. Your breath should be normal. Now, it's not a measurement of the maximum breath hold time because the mm. maximum breath hold time is influenced by willpower and determination. You are stopping breathing at the end of a normal exhalation and you're timing it in seconds until the brain sends a reaction to breathe. Mm -hmm. So it's, an, it's a measurement of dyspnea or breathlessness. If you have an individual with a bowl score of less than 25 seconds, it's a very strong indicator that they have dysfunctional breathing patterns. Kiesel, Professor Kiesel from, again, one of the universities in the United States, don't know which one, can't remember, he did a study with a group of athletes, and I think it was a decent enough population. I think it was 51 individuals. And he looked at their breathing from many different perspectives. And he concluded that the bolt score, he didn't call it bolt score, but it's exactly what we do. He concluded that the breath hold time, if it's above 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that this functional breathing is not present mm -hmm. once you're above 25 seconds. Now, what, what does it mean to the average individual? Your breath toll time at rest is going to give you some indicator of how you breathe during rest, sleep, and physical exercise. And if you have a low breath toll time during rest, you will have greater disproportionate breathlessness during physical exercise. You're more likely to gas out too soon. 
you're more likely to have um, respiratory muscle fatigue because you're having to work your, your muscles harder. Um, it can lead to muscle fatigue as well because the harder you breathe, it's also causing blood vessels to constrict and less oxygen gets delivered to the working muscles. And maybe that's something that we do need to talk about because many people believe that the more air you breathe, the mm -hmm. more oxygen that gets delivered throughout the body. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it happens. Mm -hmm. But I will talk about that in a second. But the one point that I want to make is individuals with a higher bolt score, it's a lot easier to sustain nasal breathing. And the group of individuals who tend to have a lower bolt score because it is influenced by genetics, anybody with childhood asthma, anybody with, even if they're asthma, if they grew out of their asthma, hmm. they, they still have a tendency towards a lower bolt score. Anybody with asthma or breathing difficulties because the bolt score also is determined, it's influenced by the communication coming from the lungs to the brain. Hmm. It's not just that it's top down, but it's also bottom up. Um, individuals with anxiety, 80% of individuals with anxiety and panic disorder are predisposed to dysfunctional breathing patterns. So if there's a genetic predisposition there, and you know, listen, anxiety is going to be prevalent in the athlete population, mm. of course. And it's also prevalent in individuals with perfectionist tendencies, <laughs> because these same individuals, type A, they're very driven, they set high demands on themselves, and your breathing response to that mm. because it's a stress on the body. Mm. You know, if the mind, if there's a stress on the mind, the body doesn't know whether, you know, when you're thinking about something, the body is not able to distinguish be between an, a real event that's after taking place or an imagined event. Mm. So if you're thinking about something and if you're worrying about something and that imagination is running rife, your body is going to react almost the same way as if that event has taken place. As if it's so, a physical threat. Well, it's like this. Mm. If I was to say to you, I'd like to, you to imagine biting into a lemon, you know, and you're biting into a lemon, you'll start automatically noticing that saliva will change in the mouth. Mm. So the, the body reacts to the mind. And of course, you know, the mind is also going to react to the body. There's bidirectional feedback there. Um, but com coming back to it, yeah, you will have a lot of athletes in the population, but a lot of individuals, that their breathing patterns are under par. And I suppose typically a guy will say to you, yeah, he says, I knew there was something up, but I was training hard, but no matter how I was training, I was never seeming to get across that. I was always plateauing. And the other thing about it is that if you're watching your breathing during the day, during sleep, and if you have decent breathing patterns, it's your everyday breathing that determines how well you breathe during physical exercise. Physical exercise does not change your breathing. It doesn't train your breathing. The only exception to that is swimming. Mm. And the reason being is because swimming, you're lying on the pool or the water. The water is pressing against, the against your, your body. You're, it's adding an extra load onto the breathing muscles. This is helping to improve respiratory muscle strength. But also during swimming, your face is in the water. When your face is in the water, it forces you to breathe less air. When you're forced to breathe less air, your tolerance to carbon dioxide improves. Carbon dioxide is the stimulus to breathe. And if you've got an improved tolerance to CO2, your breathing is naturally lighter during rest and during physical exercise. And the BOLT score is a measure of the chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So... You know, people with a low bolt score, they have a strong chemosensitivity of the body to the buildup of CO2 because it's not oxygen that drives our breathing. The body breathes to breathe out excess carbon dioxide. But the key here is it's not about breathing out too much carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people will say that oxygen is good and carbon dioxide is bad. They don't seem to realize that in order for oxygen to transfer from the red blood cells whereby most of the oxygen in the blood is carried by the red blood cells, it's bound by hemoglobin. In order for hemoglobin to release the oxygen, carbon dioxide must be present. Mm -hmm. So carbon dioxide, increased body temperature, to treat is phosphoglycerate. But if you're breathing hard, you can get rid of, you can lower the carbon dioxide in your lungs by half within about 30 seconds to one minute of hard breathing. This in turn will reduce carbon dioxide in the blood, when the carbon dioxide in the blood is reduced, blood vessels constrict and less oxygen gets delivered throughout the body. So if I was to say to any individual, breathe hard for 15 breaths, 
how do they feel mm. they feel lightheaded that's not a sign of super oxygenation mm -hmm. that's a sign of reduced blood flow and reduced oxygen delivery and the other aspect is here if anybody is going around hard breathing they will have a tendency towards cold hands and cold feet and possibly brain fog because our breathing is influencing our blood circulation we have 70,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body and if we are in a habit as I was of mouth breathing I always had cold hands I always had cold feet I remember as a youngster being my 20s in universities and if I was lucky enough to score with some some lovely female you know she'd be she'd be running to the other side of the bed because my feet would be absolutely freezing and like those are the things that you can you can kind of always remember so you know again we just and brain fog is the other thing like breathing hard in the belief that it's increasing blood flow to the brain is earnest if you want to increase blood flow to the brain hold your breath mm. because as you hold your breath carbon dioxide increases in the blood and as carbon dioxide increases in the blood the carotid arteries dilate so for example if i'm giving a presentation i speak publicly and oftentimes i don't use powerpoints because I, I don't like powerpoints because i think the audience gets hypnotized by looking at the screen mm -hmm. And I want to shut off the PowerPoint and I want to look at the audience face to face, look into their eyes and communicate with them. And I always have my own kind of pre-ritual before a presentation. I do slow breathing, very light breathing with an air hunger. It helps me anchor my attention on the breath and I deliberately slow down the breath sitting down to create an air hunger for about sometimes 15, 20 minutes. I really slow down the breath breathing with lateral expansion of the lower ribs. So I'm breathing light, that I'm not taking in so much air. I'm breathing slow, that mm -hmm. I reduce it to about six breaths per minute. And I'm breathing deep with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. That helps me to be really focused. It helps me to be concentrated. And also, it helps me, it helps to activate the parasympathetic response mm -hmm. and to bring quietness to the mind. But then I am too relaxed. After doing 20 minutes of slow breathing with air hunger, I then do five strong, well, I do two easy breath holds and then five breath holds to create a strong air hunger. So I bring my body from a parasympathetic response then into a sympathetic response to increase alertness. So if anybody is feeling fatigued or if their nose is un stuffy or if their airways are a little bit tight, you can change your, you can apply breathing exercises mm -hmm. And I suppose the time, like the wonderful thing about the breath is now it's getting attention. And, you know, it's, it, this like following breathing is not just the domain of people who are kind of like, it's not a new age thing. Mm -hmm. It should be absolutely mainstream because if you look at, if you look at the attributes of real successful leaders in regardless of what, what endeavor they do in life, if it's business, if it's sports, no matter what they are doing, they need a few attributes. One mm. is energy. Mm. You need good sleep. Breathing plays a role in that. If you're sleeping with your mouth open, snoring all night, waking up groggy, how can you be at the best of your field? Number two, you need concentration. What is concentration? But your ability to hold your attention on a subject matter for a period of time without distraction. And if the mind is all over the place, you are not focused hmm. and you are not able to place your attention on what you need to place it upon. We need to train the brain. You train the brain to be able to hold its attention by focusing on the breath, or at least it's one way to do it. And I think it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And when people start focusing on their breathing, yes, the mind wanders. You bring your attention back, the mind wanders. You bring your attention back, the mind wanders. That is the practice. But in the process, a stillness will come to mm. the mind. It doesn't happen quickly. It can happen over a little bit of time. But I would say six to eight weeks, you will notice a difference. Mm -hmm. The third aspect is that we need to increase blood flow to the brain. We don't do that by breathing hard. And if we are breathing hard with a low bolt score, mm. it can indicate hard breathing, which will result oxygen delivery to the brain. This agitates the central nervous system. There's increased neuronal excitability. Um, and this in turn can increase, you know, increased thought activity because the body is in a fight or flight mm. response. 
So if I see somebody coming into me, typically with anxiety and panic disorder, the most common tread or the most common characteristics of breathing that I see is I see fast upper chest breathing. Yes, it is true. When we have anxiety, our breathing becomes faster, irregular upper chest. Mm -hmm. It's not just that anxiety is changing our breathing patterns, but a faulty breathing pattern over time is going to feed back into anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder, why is why are people going to, they go to their psychologist, they go to their psychotherapist, they go to their psychiatrist, they get counseling, excellent, they're getting counseling. It's not addressing respiratory physiology, it's not improving sleep. How can you have a calm mind unless you have calm breathing, yeah. unless the body is in a state of relaxation and unless you have sleep quality? It's being overlooked, and it's because as human beings, we are all in our own little silos. My silo is breathing. I don't know very much about nutrition, but I have an idea. Don't be eating bars of chocolate. Don't be eating food that's advertised too often. But I don't talk about nutrition because my silo is breathing. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that we, we should, I suppose, be considering things that are outside of our normal routine and bringing them in and um, because i think if breathing is being overlooked there's an essential human function there if it's not up to par you're not going to get the results that really we should be achieving mm -hmm. that's there's tons of really interesting stuff there and maybe we just could we just talk about some of the fundamentals we, we a little bit more that concept of the deep breath Yes. And this is you mentioned this at the outset. So when people think, oh, take a, a long you take a deep breath to calm yourself down. Yes. And that's what you talk about. Actually, that's 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 faulty. You've 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 used the terms uh, light light breathing. Um, yes. Yes. Could you explain so, explain that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Like with breathing, there's three dimensions to breathing. There's a biochemical dimension which is based on carbon dioxide and that's that's influenced by the volume of air that you breathe mm -hmm. and the volume of air you breathe is your respiratory rate multiplied by the size of the breath but mm -hmm. how much air do you breathe in a minute that determines biochemistry the biomechanics then is whether you are breathing fast or sorry whether you are breathing upper chest or whether you are breathing down low mm -hmm. and then another aspect then is the cadence of the breath in terms of what you can practice to stimulate the vagus nerve. So when I'm working with a student, I'll typically start off with improving their biochemistry first. Because I get I, what I simply do is, mm -hmm. and your listeners can even practice this, sit down, put one hand on your chest, one hand just above your navel, tune into your breathing patterns and gently slow down the speed of the air as it enters and leaves your nose Breathe almost that you feel hardly any air coming in and out of your nose. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't hear it and you should hardly feel it. And do that for about three to four minutes to the point that you feel an air hunger. The air hunger signifies that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. Mm -hmm. And with that, check the temperature of your fingers. Earlier on, I said when you breathe hard, your hands are mm -hmm. cold. Can you slow down and reduce the volume of air that you are breathing to improve your blood circulation? Check the saliva in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Three to four minutes of reduced light breathing, you've got increased watery saliva in the mouth. That's an indicator that you've activated a parasympathetic or a relaxation response. Also, your mind is less likely to wander. Mm -hmm. When you focus on the breath with the view of reducing the volume of breathing to create air hunger. Okay, so that's one aspect of breathing. The second aspect is, we have students place their hands at either side of their lower ribs, mm -hmm. just at the base of the ribs, mm -hmm. where at the bottom of the chest, but on the sides. Mm. I have them breathe in for four seconds, and then I have them breathe out for six seconds. I don't have them breathe frontal. I don't have them breathe in, push belly out. I used to. Okay. But then I realized that some of my students, they would be breathing in, they're pushing their belly out. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I want lateral expansion and contraction at the side, which is an indicator of the generation of what's called intra-abdominal pressure. And this is deep breathing, mm. but you should not hear it. You don't, you know, 
what when people are told to take a deep breath, they are not taking a deep breath. They're taking a big breath in general. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect is that in order to activate the biomechanics of breathing, you shouldn't sacrifice the biochemistry. And I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. If you go to some yoga studios, the instructor will make a deliberate emphasis on people to start breathing more air in. How do you know? Because you will hear people breathing inside the studio. Mm -hmm. So the, the instructor is directing the students to activate the lower regions of the lungs to improve the biomechanics of breathing. But in, this, in the process, the instructor is sacrificing the biochemistry. So okay. this is not good. We, mm -hmm. we cannot just look at breathing so isolated. It's not just mm -hmm. about the biomechanics. So, you know, and I know somebody could say I'm complicating it. I'm not. Mm -hmm. It's because breathing is simple and yet not that simple. But at the same time, if you were just sitting in your couch, lying back into it, slowing down your breathing, can you improve your blood circulation? Number two, then spend a mm. few minutes slowing down your breathing mm -hmm. with air hunger. Number two, then put your hands either side of your lower ribs. Your mouth is closed, your tongue is resting in the roof of the mouth. As you breathe in, your ribs are gently moving out. And as you breathe out, your ribs are gently moving in. That is deep breathing in the true sense of the word. In other words, you are taking the air into the lower regions of the lungs, but you can breathe light and you can breathe deep at the same time. The third aspect then is we bring in cadence breathing. Mm -hmm. The optimal breathing rate to influence the autonomic nervous system is 5.5 to six breaths per minute. And that can be a timing of four seconds in and six seconds out, or five seconds in and five seconds out. Your vagus nerve is a wandering nerve that's coming from the back of the, the brain mm -hmm. and it's wandering throughout the body. And there's a lot of communication from the vagus nerve by the vagus nerve from the body back to the brain. But it's the vagus nerve that is responsible for the activation of the parasympathetic response. So we can tap into directly bringing mm. the body into relaxation by slowing down the breath and a prolonged exhalation is the key to activating the parasympathetic mm. response. Now, the other aspect is that we want to achieve a balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. We want to have a balance between fight and flight and relaxation. The human body, we don't want to be in a state of switched on all the time, mm -hmm. nor do we want to be in a state of switched off all the time. We need to be resilient. And when we practice changing our breathing patterns to six breaths per minute, we stimulate the vagus nerve. We also exercise what's called baroreceptors or pressure receptors in the major blood vessels, in the aorta and the carotid arteries. And these in turn then modify and improve what's called heart rate variability. So <clears throat> for over 200 years, therapists have understood that your heart shouldn't beat the timing between each heartbeat shouldn't be the same. Right. And what they used to do is when they had their client, they would locate the pulse of the client and they would look at the synchronicity between the timing of the heartbeat and their breathing. When we breathe in, the heartbeat is getting faster because during the inspiration, mm. the vagus nerve withdraws. Mm. So the, the breath in is more sympathetically driven. During the breath out, it's primarily activated by the vagus nerve. And during the breath out, the heartbeat should be slowing down. The timing between beats on the inspiration as compared to the expiration should be different. Mm -hmm. The time between heartbeats on the inspiration on the breath in should be shorter than on the breath out. Mm -hmm. And that is a measure of resilience of the human individual because people who have got irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, poor aerobic fitness, mm -hmm. asthma, and a host of other different conditions, they have reduced heart rate variability. And heart rate variability mm -hmm. is a very good marker of the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. But here's the thing, when your bolt score is improving, the functioning and the sensitivity of the baroreceptors are improving, and the functioning of the autonomic nervous system is improving. Mm -hmm. How can I make that connection? Well, when you slow down your breathing to six breaths per minute, 
you you reduce the chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide you modify the bioreceptors or you're exercising the bioreceptors and there's a link between mm. you know both the sensitivity of the bioreceptors the more sensitive your bioreceptors are to changes in blood pressure in the, in the body the reduced the more your chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide is reduced there's an inverse relationship there so it's all interconnected mm -hmm. and that's why with breathing you know the oxygen advantage i wrote that six years ago mm -hmm. and i'm currently writing a new book okay um i'm looking at the whole connection number one is in terms of slow breathing for the benefits of people with type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. it doesn't get discussed epilepsy um females in terms of the female hormones that's only a part that i'm starting to explore i suppose 47 year old man you tend to avoid the whole female um, <laughs> physiology because number one is I'm a male and next I'm, I'm an Irish male, which is even worse because we tend to be a bit shyer. So, so yeah, so I've kind of, I'm going down that path and I'm starting to look at the connection between what else is out there mm. because the research is there and in some ways the science is only starting to catch up. Right. None of this is new, but I will also say one thing. There are many misconceptions about the breath mm -hmm. and many people if you're teaching breathing exercises, please learn the physiology of breathing before you start teaching students. Because if you're telling people to take big, hard breaths, right. and if that person thinks this is a good thing to do, you could do more harm than good. Yeah. And as we discussed a little bit earlier, the, the natural, because it just sounds so easy, is just you breathe in oxygen, breathe out CO2. It just make, yes. You just think, oh, that just makes a lot of sense. So therefore, breathe you know breathe more oxygen breathe out more co2 so that's better but what you're talking about actually when you, you talk about over breathing that actually when we're breathing yes. out actually we're we're getting rid of more co2 than we need but we need that co2 yeah. mm -hmm. yes and it can happen why would we be in the habit of over breathing well mm -hmm. i suppose we live very differently now than what we did throughout our evolution sure you know For, one thing is we're talking a lot um, mm -hmm. How many people, their jobs, they go in at nine o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning and they're talking until five o'clock that evening. They're mm -hmm. on the phone. They're making a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. Talking increases your breathing. And if you're talking a lot, you're going to breathe harder. And as you breathe harder, it's going to reduce blood flow to the brain. Mm. So it but this depends on genetic predisposition. Okay. Some people who talk for a living. They will be absolutely exhausted at the end of a day's talking mm -hmm. and they don't tend to put the connection between it's their breathing right. and their talking, which is causing exhaustion. It's not the concentration and focus. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two is we do have a belief that it's good to big breed. Mm -hmm. There is an earnest belief out there that oxygen is good and carbon dioxide is bad. We have to look at the functions of carbon dioxide in the human body. The human body needs a 5% of atmospheric pressure of carbon dioxide in the lungs and blood. The pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 0.04%. So our human body hmm. needs significantly more carbon dioxide than what's contained in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is produced as part of our metabolism, but the key is breathe a normal volume of air per minute, then you have normal carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is playing a role as a vasodilator in your blood vessels. And also the Bohr effect discovered back in 1904 by a mm. Danish physiologist. He said that the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood is influencing the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. In other words, when you breathe in air and that oxygen passes from the lungs into the blood and in the blood, most of the oxygen, 98% of it, is carried by hemoglobin molecules, mm -hmm. which are a protein within the red blood cells. But hemoglobin releases oxygen in the presence of carbon dioxide. As carbon dioxide increases, blood pH drops and hemoglobin mm -hmm. releases oxygen to the tissues. Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide is the primary regulator of blood pH. How many times have we heard about alkaline diet? Yes. You know, which is all very beneficial, but in actual fact, it's your respiration. That's the primary regulator of your blood pH. Yes. So if you breathe too hard, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs, and this drives up your blood pH to cause respiratory alkalosis. However, 
when there is respiratory alkalosis, the central nervous system is agitated. Mm. Neuronal excitability increases. The body wants homeostasis, and homeostasis of the blood is 7.365. So, you know, there's a number of things that are influencing and causing us to overbreed. And probably with adults, it's stress. Mm-hmm. Because when we get stressed, and you can imagine what was happening here. Uh, it's similar enough in the UK, but certainly in Ireland, we had a, an awful crash back in 2007. Sure. And a lot of stress, as uh, many people, my generation, you know, we bought mm. our houses. I bought my own house in 2006. Mm. And many people my age, they were in the house that had halved in value overnight. Mm-hmm. They weren't able to afford a mortgage, but it was a long term stress that they were being exposed to. Mm-hmm. We were able, as human beings, we were able to cope with short term stresses throughout our evolution. As the human species, we always had some short term stresses. We're very well able to adapt to them. However, mm. never in history have we been exposed to such long term stress. And long term stress, your breathing gets harder. And if you're breathing harder in the long term, a biochemical change takes mm-hmm. place. And the theory is that your kidneys dump bicarbonate. And now you're stuck in this pattern of overbreathing. But the pattern of overbreathing is feeding back into your stress. It's feeding back into the anxiety. So we have to, you know, I would say to somebody, if you're under stress, start looking towards your breath. And Google Stanford Medical School and slow breathing. Mm -hmm. In March of 2017, they identified a new structure in the brain in the locus corollis. And they said that this structure is spying on your breathing. If you breathe fast, the brain is more likely to be agitated. And you are also more likely to wake up from sleep. Mm. If you breathe slow, it has a calming effect on the brain. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you're practicing gently slowing down the speed of your breathing, not only are you taking your attention out of the mind and placing it on the breath, so you're bringing some stillness to the mind, but you are also activating a parasympathetic response. And if you breathe lighter, you're increasing blood flow to the brain. So I think there are so many benefits Mm. that we can do. And yes, I think there should be some awareness that how should we breathe in terms of the volume of air we're breathing, where we should be breathing to, and also practicing cadence breathing to stimulate the vagus nerve. Mm. It's a lot of good stuff there. There's obviously a lot of people now that are going through a time of stress and we are probably going to be in this thing for several months. Therefore the, what you talked about prolonged stress is a, is a factor for loads of us. I also have a lot of listeners that are those type a perfectionist people. I'm one of them. And I, so, so it's, it's about breathing, not just for anxiety and stress, which I've certainly go through, but also just being just when I get too excited about something, I start to speak more quickly and I'm even doing it now. And, and I think a lot of us can, can relate to that. So taking control of our breath is, is incredibly powerful. I do want to talk about, uh, before we, we wrap up the differences between the oxygen advantage and the Wim Hof technique, which yes. I've, I've been trying as well, uh, recently and it's been very interesting, but they are fundamentally different things. And I want to, get your view on what you teach versus what Wim Hof teaches and the the differences and all of that all of that stuff I think that'd be very interesting yeah so like from a breathing perspective with the oxygen advantage there are two pillars Mm -hmm. one is I want to improve everyday breathing patterns and that's evident by a higher bolt score Mm -hmm. and number two is we do breath holding to stress the body Mm mm-hmm the Wim Hof technique does hyperventilation and breath holding to stress the body. Mm-hmm. We do breath holding, but we have normal breathing, and then we take a normal breath in and out and hold yep. the breath. And then we start walking and mm-hmm. walk faster, jog, run, mm-hmm. sprint, holding the breath into a pretty strong air hunger, mm-hmm. and then minimal breathing for six breaths, and then normal breathing for 12 mm-hmm. to 18 breaths. And typically we'll do five reps in one set. Mm -hmm. Now, why are we doing that? Well, during the breath hold, your cells continue to extract oxygen 
and you are not replenishing it through breathing. So we are doing it to drive down blood oxygen mm -hmm. saturation to create hypoxic effect. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, carbon dioxide is increasing. And it's the hypoxic mm -hmm. effect and the hypercapnic response that is increasing hydrogen ion in the blood, which is disturbing the blood acid base balance. So we're putting the body into a really severe state of anaerobic glycolysis to force the body to make adaptations to improve the buffering capacity inside in the muscle. Mm -hmm. So the oxygen advantage is intermittent, hypoxic, hypercapnic training. The benefit of having the carbon dioxide intact is that it's increasing blood flow to the brain. Mm -hmm. So the brain doesn't get deprived of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So it'll help you more alert, it'll help open up your nose, it'll open up your lungs, mm -hmm. and you also get a spleen contraction. Mm -hmm. So your spleen is your blood bank that contains about 8% of your red blood cells. And if you do five breath holds, anything above 30 seconds, it will provoke the spleen to release red blood cells into circulation. Mm -hmm. Now, before anybody tries it, don't ever do breath holding if you are pregnant. Mm -hmm. I would say don't do any breathing exercises if you're pregnant. Just do relaxation with nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. Don't do breath holding if you have anxiety or panic disorder or at least try and ascertain if you're able to cope with the, the feeling of air hunger. Because I have done breath holding with people and I've put them into a sympathetic response, which we wanted, mm -hmm. but they couldn't switch off. Right. And, you know, like this is what 18 years of experience tells me about breathing. We can't just tell everybody this is for you. Right. You know, there's there's right. some exercises suit some people and some exercises suit other people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the oxygen advantage. The Wim Hof technique involves hyperventilating for 30 breaths. Mm -hmm. That will get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. Carbon dioxide is the drive to breathe. If you remove a lot of carbon dioxide from the blood, you don't feel the sensation to breathe for a long time. Sure. Because it takes quite a while for mm. carbon dioxide to accumulate in the blood to the point that it triggers breathing. Mm. So as a result, if you hold, if you hyperventilate and then hold your breath, you can hold your breath for an awful lot longer because the alarm to breathe is being depleted. Mm -hmm. And as you hold your breath for a lot longer, your blood oxygen levels, your blood oxygen saturation levels will drop to very low levels. So after doing, so typically with the Wim Hof method, and they may have some differences in techniques, hyperventilate for 30 breaths, exhale, hold, mm -hmm. then breathe in and hold breath for 10 seconds and then resume hyperventilation a second mm -hmm. cycle again, exhale, hold, hold your breath until maybe a medium strong air hunger, then breathe in, hold your breath for 10 seconds and repeat it. When you look at Cox's paper, Matthias Cox in 2014, when I looked at the blood gases, the carbon dioxide never recovered throughout the breathing exercise. So my okay. conclusion then was that the Wim Hof technique is a hypoxic, hypocapnic, intermittent risk. Okay. It's, it's intermittent, hypoxic, hypocapnic, low CO2. Yes. Now, it's an interesting technique. And sometimes with the Wim Hof people, if I say something, they sometimes come down at me very hard. Right. <laughs> and I'm only exploring yeah. it from a breathing point yes. of view. Yeah. But I think it's interesting, you know, um, it's, it's like somebody criticizing somebody's religion. It's very tribal, that's, isn't it? Uh, yes, it yeah. seems yeah. to me. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's funny. And uh, so here's the point about it. That was a very interesting paper by Cox. In terms of when you do hyperventilation, and you do a strong breath hold, it's obviously activating a real stress response in mm -hmm. the body. Mm -hmm. And it's increasing in ep epinephrine. But there, there, I with, presume there are some benefits to that, though. There are. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm going to go through. Mm -hmm. With the increase to epinephrine, pro-inflammatory cells reduced. So cells which are involved in producing inflammation reduced. And anti-inflammatory cells increased. Mm -hmm. So cells which are fighting inflammation increased. Mm -hmm. So it activated, it stressed the human body, which in turn had an influence seem, seeming to suppress or to, to have some influence on the immune system. So that when the individuals were injected with endotoxins, those who were practicing the Wim Hof technique were better able to resist the symptoms of the flu. Right. Now, here is the real the question that I would love to find out. Because from many years working with people with asthma, we used to see that their chest infections would reduce. 
I've seen people with, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome making progress, irritable bowel syndrome, and a lot of conditions which would be considered, you know, immune conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so wh how, the question here is, in order to stress the body, how much of a change in the blood gases do you need to achieve? So with the oxygen advantage, we're dropping the, the blood down to severe hypoxia. In other words, I want to get SpO2, which is the saturation of the peripheral blood vessels with oxygen, it's a good approximation of arterial blood gases. Mm -hmm. I want to get it down to about 85% because that's severe. Now with the Wim Hof technique, when you do hyperventilation and breath holding, you can drop the blood oxygen saturation down to 50%. Mm. Now, so it's different. So it's a stronger effect, the Wim Hof technique is, and the oxygen advantage, yeah, it, it'll feel pretty strong. Um, because we leave carbon dioxide intact. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some there's some similarities mm -hmm. with the Wim Hof technique. Listen, he's done a tremendous job in yeah. putting breathing out there. Right. And, you know, I, I think it, it really does need so much more research because right. in terms of healthcare, you know, there are a group of individuals that could benefit so much if the if the immune system can be influenced through the breath, mm -hmm. which is very possible. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. Um, in what I've seen over the years, we need more research. Mm -hmm. Like we have twenty we have twenty clinical trials on asthma. I've been involved with four or five of them. And in order for breathing to play a role in asthma we would need 500 papers published in PubMed, mm. and it would typically need about 20 years. Now we are 20 years doing it, mm -hmm. but we only have 20 papers. And as a result, you have 5.6 million or thereabouts people in the UK yes. with asthma. Yes. The vast majority of them will be going around with an open mouth. They will go to their doctor's surgery with the, open, with the mouth open. They get their prescription of medication and they leave with their mouth open. And nobody is telling these kids, mm -hmm. breathe through the nose. Nobody is telling the adults, breathe through the nose. And all of your athletes who are prone to exercise induced bronchoconstriction, which can affect the athlete population up to 50%, they too should breathe through their nose during mm -hmm. physical exercise mm -hmm. to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. There's, I know uh, we, we need to wrap up shortly because i know you have a, a a client that you need to speak to but uh yeah. just uh just w one of the things when i came across your i'm a cyclist so when you talked about increasing epo and 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 things like that i was oh wow this is and you know it's simulating high altitude training that yes. uh, you can actually do that without having to live in the alps or, yes. or wherever yes um yeah which is which yeah. is which is really interesting now there are some non-responders Okay. Um, so if you look at some papers by Matt Richardson mm. or Erika, Erika Shagate, I, I can't pronounce her name, but she's from Mid-Sweden University. And they have done so many different papers over the last 15 years on breath holding with the purpose of dropping the blood oxygen saturation down to 85% is what we, that's our goal to mm -hmm. achieve. That even a paper I looked at yesterday by De Bruyne, Richardson and Shagate, I can't remember when it was published, but they had individuals do five breath holds, 10 minutes rest, five breath holds, 10 minutes rest, five breath holds, 10 minutes rest. Um, Erythropoietin, EPO, increased by 24%. And this was akin to six hours at an altitude of mm -hmm. 1,780 meters. Mm -hmm. and, and for anyone who doesn't know about EPO, that's the stuff that Lance Armstrong and all these other cyclists have <laughs> taken. <laughs> yes. So, so when you have an increase of EPO, um, it's causing a maturation of the blood cells in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So your red blood cells mature, and as a result then, you've got an increased oxygen carrying capacity. The body is carrying more oxygen. You've got greater oxygen delivery density to working muscles, so your VO2 max improves. Mm -hmm. But we have seen some papers that, yes, it's happening. And I've seen some athletes that I'm working with, yes, we've seen their hematocrit increasing, but others... I haven't. Mm -hmm. So there okay. are non-responders, but breath holding is not just about improving the aerobic capacity. Mm -hmm. I think the anaerobic capacity is the key here, mm -hmm. improving and delaying delaying lactic acid and fatigue by doing breath holding. Yeah, that's. An, I'm going to work a lot more on that because I find when I'm cycling at a kind of endurance pace, I can just go, go, go. But when I when I'm in a like a shorter, let's say a short time trial or something, I'm just not as I'm just not as good as people that yeah. I can 
I can cycle with for long, long periods of time. And anyway, as an aside, um, and uh, before we, we kind of uh, wrap up, I know that you, we didn't talk about taping your mouth when you're sleeping, which is, <laughs> which is yeah, it's huge, interesting. huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we've brought out our own tape because, of course, and I'll show it to you if you don't mind. It's not a, yeah. I'm not trying to plug anything. It's no, just no, the it's... idea behind it for children. Um, mm -hmm. 25 to 50 percent of children persistently mouth breathe, mm -hmm. and it's having a negative impact on these kids, their sleep, their concentration and focus. And I used to get frustrated with the kids coming into me and they'd have the mouth open. I don't I, because they can breathe through their nose because we showed them the exercises to mm. open up their nose. Mm. And this tape here is based on this idea. It's called Myo tape, M-Y-O tape. And it's kinesio tape. Mm -hmm. And literally. Uh -huh. Right. So for people with anxiety, we're able now to get the mouth closed. Yes. Because the elasticity of the tape is bringing everything together. Yes. But also for kids over four and five years of age. So that we can help ensure nasal breathing during sleep, mm -hmm. but without the risk. Right. Because that right. was always something we had okay. to we had to yeah. avoid. Right. But but adults can also just like firmly just kind of shut their their uh their yeah, mouths. Well, the, most yeah. of them, you know, the other option is you've got three M one inch micropore mm -hmm. tape. Mm -hmm. um, and this we used this for many many years mm -hmm. you know but for people who are anxious they don't tend to want to use yeah. this what yeah. I would say is any of you waking up at a dry mouth in the morning start breathing through mm -hmm. your nose yes okay and uh, lastly uh, for anyone who's kind of listening one of the things well what are perhaps one or two things that people who are listening can, can just do today to well, listen look start do go for your walk with your mouth closed mm-hmm mm -hmm. Do your cycle, do your jog with your mouth closed. Initially, it's a bit tougher. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is you're, you're putting the body in, into a situation that your body's going to make adaptations. Mm -hmm. And there's no comparison. Like if you look, and if you want to see some of the signs, go to oxygenadvantage.com, click on about, science, and then you'll see a, a list of different articles I've written. One is on nasal breathing during running. And it's the same, same mm -hmm. principle applies for cycling. Mm -hmm. One is on stimulating the vagus nerve. So you'll see different things there, you know, different articles that may like repeated sprintability, improving that in rugby and mm -hmm. um, using breath holding. And uh, so, yeah, so start with nose breathing first. Start start doing the opposite to what people have been telling you for years. They've been telling you to take big breaths, sit down for five minutes and really reduce the volume of air that you are breathing mm -hmm. to the point of air hunger. Yeah. It mightn't be too comfortable, mm -hmm. but don't do it to the point that it gets stressful. So right. you have air hunger. Check Air hunger meaning just simply the desire to, to, to breathe. breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the desire to breathe. Check does it change your blood flow? Mm -hmm. Do the temperatures in your finger increase? Um, do you feel increased watery mm -hmm. saliva in the mouth? If your nose is stuffy and mm -hmm. if you're not pregnant or if you don't have cardiovascular issues or major medical issues and your nose is stuffy, to unblock your nose, take a normal breath in and out of your nose, hold your nose and walk mm -hmm. around holding your breath mm -hmm. and then let go and breathe in through your nose. And you'll see that exercise if you go to the home page of oxygenadvantage.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We've got two measurements there. One is the bolt score. There's mm -hmm. a video. And Great. the second one, it's the maximum breathlessness test. Mm -hmm. But the maximum breathlessness test is also an interesting test for athletes. Um, but if you do that test five or six times, your nose will open up. And I'd say, listen, experiment with this because it's amazing what can be done through the breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just about really, you know, practice it and experience it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Patrick. How can we, you talked about your website. How else can people follow you, find you, anything sure. along those lines? Um, yeah, we're on Instagram and we, we release a lot of videos up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. All of the videos for children are completely free on YouTube. And um, they're from the Buteco Clinic. So any of you who have kids, you know, all of the are complete. Every exercise from the children's program, we record it completely up there for free. And um, there's various interviews as well. Interesting individuals. I interviewed a guy called Ricky Johnson last night or, or a few days ago. And we have that up. He's a, a national motocross and supercross cyclist and the extreme truck off-roader. I also interviewed James Nestor. He's got a new book coming out called The Brett. 
mm-hmm. interviewed people in the business world, interviewed people in the golfing world. And, uh, you know, it's kind of just getting the perspectives and mm-hmm. how can you apply, apply breathing. Mm-hmm. It's it's not just for the open sandal brigade and sure. tree huggers. Not sure. that there's anything wrong with that. It's mainstream and that's mm-hmm. the way it should be. Fantastic. Patrick, this is great. Thank you so much and much appreciated. Sure. Thank you, Ben.